and it should be asking people to to approve but yeah with with that in mind i just want to say thank you to all of you for being here um it's uh, at least here in the uk and we're here in new york as well it's a very very sunny day so it's kind of like one of those moments that we'd rather be outside but no, we, we're going to spend a, an hour together here and really thankful to have my good friend and colleague jp bailey with us today so um this is like a, a ask a Kanban trainer, any sort of questions that you have, things that you'd like to share. Um, so you have questions, please put them on the chat. We'll try to read them or um, read them um, and have a chat about this, make it a conversation. I can invite pe the people with the questions to, to ask the question verbally, if you prefer, um, or we can read the questions for you. Um, but yeah, we try to make it a conversation, conversational style, see, see sort of questions, explore anything about Kanban, flow, anything on this on this topic. OK, um, so if you have any questions, please, you know, uh, put them on on chat and we we will we will get, um, you know, we'll see what, what JP thinks about those things. OK, so please try, try to put the questions on on the on the chat. Um, as I was saying, this is a joint event, as usual, with the Linajal London Meta Group, the Linajal Global Conference, and with the Pro Kanban um, Meta Group. So we have a varied community. There is people here from Linajal London that would normally be from, from the UK, but Linajal Global and Pro Kanban, we have like a, a very multi, multi, multinational, that sounds very corporate, a very universal and global spread. We've got people from, from the US, I think people from, from Latin America, UK, Europe. So yeah, it's a good way of, you know, perhaps exploring like Kanban across different, in different places, different industries and different stuff. Cool. Um, but we need your questions. Um, while we wait for questions. All right. Okay. Well, we've got a question there. Thank you, Don. I was going to ask, I, Otherwise, I was starting. If you let me ask the questions to JP, I, you know, I, I will, I'll be mean. Um, no. Um, so, Don, come on, you had a question. Why don't you, why don't you ask the question to JP? Yeah, um, hearing lots of, hi JP, um, hearing lots of interesting ideas around managing flow by using item age in, instead of whip, um, whip limits and interested on your thoughts on this experience, um, that kind of thing. Um, so, I mean, item age is, using item age as a, um, to help with a pull policy is something which um, I think is very, very powerful. Um, but I, I think the having some sense of, um, well, some way of limiting WIP is also useful. The two things for me go hand in hand. Uh, what I've tended to see is when people start to focus on those things, then they have pretty dramatic improvements to the stability of their system. Uh, which then just means that their forecasting gets a lot better um, and you know people can be a lot more trusting and confident in their forecasts so that's that's what I've uh, what, what we've um, you know seen when we apply those two things side by side rather than one alone the, the risk is with if you apply just work item age without any sense of, of limiting width well as far as I see it is there's still the possibility that people might carry on pulling work into the system and ignoring work that's kind of you know, should just be being worked on and getting done. Uh, so it, it, it's it's kind of the the two things together are important. Um, I, I very consciously use the phrase limiting whip rather than whip limits because there's lots and lots of different ways of limiting whip. Um, and uh, you know, I mean, ultimately, I suppose it, you could say it's just down to semantics, but um, uh, you don't have to have like you know a number there. You can have you know one in one out well sorry one out one in um and and um approaches like that for limiting whip as well you don't necessarily have to have a a, a hard and fast figure i, th I well, think to, uh, yeah. go on Kevin. yes i was just going to say i think to that point um focusing on item age and managing item age might be a way to whip, limit whip hmm. if we say that if something gets older than a certain age we can't start something new. We have to focus on that and we have to swarm on it or we have to do whatever we need to to get that done. That could be a form of, of limiting whip, right? Yeah, and that's a great Absolutely. point, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, mm -hmm. that is a great point. It, it needs that and though. That's that's the thing. Right. It's kind of, if you're just doing it on age alone, then there is, you know, people could be irresponsible and just let stuff age, um, uh, you know, especially when you have kind of conversations like, well, 
you know, I've done my bit on that piece of work so I can start doing things. So then it, it also depends on the context of the team and how well they're working actually as a team within within that system. And also, I suppose, also the level of the, um, the workflow that you're working at. So, uh, you know, if it's a higher level, like a portfolio level, then, you know, um, one particular part of the portfolio workflow may, might be kind of washing its hands of it and just ignoring stuff and then bringing more work in, which means that the people downstream end up getting into uh, trouble. There is a, a, a very interesting thing about um, uh, work in progress age or aging is that um, many times we say this is the, this is really, really powerful and, and is the, the one metric that a lot of people haven't heard of. I mean, we haven't heard of a few years ago, like three, three or four years ago, um, super powerful and it really, really enables things like the, you know, the, the resistance that people have to um, uh, whip limits and things like that. There's always like a fear or resistance towards that. And, and one of the things that we find many times is that when, when introducing aging as a, something to consider and when teams start realizing that what, what the impact of aging is, um, the consequence of that is that the, the, the WIP starts becoming more manageable. Uh, is what I think what JP was saying. If, if they don't, if, if a team is trying to look at age, but, the, but, but they don't stop the tsunami of lots of work coming and starting and starting and starting work, what you end up having is everything in everything looking really bad, everything really looking very aged. Yeah. Um, so, so I think when, when age, when, when teams are paying attention to aging, the, the, the natural consequence is that WIP becomes better. So I, it's a great problem. For, how many of you are using um, work item, um, aging as a, as a, as a technique, as a practice, you know, things, any, many of you? Don, I can see a few there. Yeah. 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 And uh, it's uh, we, we actually, uh, uh, JP and I were working a few years ago with a team in in, in Ireland, and, and when we visited them after a while, um, they had started to use um, aging, and it was it was a, a really really um, can I say emotional moment, JP, seeing seeing that. I mean, how different. I mean, the the, the things like the the daily standups, daily scrums, daily kanbans, how how much more collaborative, how much more powerful. How the conversations were awesome. You know, teams making decisions. Um, that was really, really powerful. Brings a lot of focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's your experience of it, Don, when you're using it? Um, I think a bit like JP was saying that I haven't used it instead of whip limits, but with it, with whip limits. And um, uh, in introducing the team teams to get that view is a view they don't often get, and they can easily miss the age of items on the board. Um, even with things like you know, Jira that has little dots to show you the age, it doesn't really give the same proper impact. Um, um, but yeah, it really changes the conversations. Yeah, cool, cool. Any follow-up questions about aging uh, before we move on? Anyone Any or any contributions? And um, can I just clarify? So when we talk about yes. um, <clears throat> uh, work aging, we, we're talking about stuff that's actually been started, right? Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not just items in the backlog. Okay. All right. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. Although <laughs> it depends. So um, yes, depending depending on what level you're having that conversation at. So um, you know, that, an item that could be in a backlog might have been considered started as part of a wider system. At which point it is actually aging within that system. So I was talking about portfolio. Um, you know, if you've got something which is considered started within a portfolio but not at the team level then is it started and and then then you've got a whole different bunch of questions to have to, to wrestle with so yeah fair enough it, yeah. it was it was more just to kevin's comment um about mm -hmm. you know focusing on the oldest item first obviously if that's in the backlog you know i'd, I'd maybe question that but now that i've got clarification it makes sense what kevin yeah. was saying thanks yeah there, there is another aspect of this because it, in, in backlogs, you, if, if from the perspective of one system, one team, so one board, whatever, yeah, if it if it's in the if it has not started, the clock hasn't started, then age is zero, yeah. Um, although mindful what JP was saying that it, it may have started some, somewhere else, then it might be considered already started. However, in the backlog perspective, then you're entering the idea of triaging and things like that. Um, you know, sometimes you find organizations that they have items there in the backlog that are six years old, three, four, five, six years old, 
yeah and they have no chance ever of um of ever being pulled in but we have a fear of hey you know we have a fear of deleting them or, or removing them because uh, they might have value i mean so this is good to have a policy that that says like you know if it's been here in this backlog for a while it should it should be removed and if it's really important it will come back yeah but um that's not considered a ticket that is aging because it has not technically started from the perspective of the system yes but and you know yes. th think about it the triaging is, is something that we probably don't do enough of great question Dylan. Like, uh... all right okay shall we move to the next question because i mean uh, jp you 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 mentioned portfolio boards and and, and things like that so um paul paul siegel you have a question about flight levels on level two would you like to ask the question maybe elaborate a little bit on it yeah so we have we have lots of uh, teams that have have either kanban boards or scrum boards but mostly kanban boards and multiple teams can be on a product um but what we're finding is the coordination is a, a challenge and i'm trying to persuade so i'm trying to initiate a, a like a flight level two board to at a, at a level higher to uh, visualize that um, progression in that workflow. But where I'm, where I'm slightly worried is how do you go about approaching a flight, designing a flight level two board because it's getting it at the right level. So not making it too detailed, but not making it too abstract. And, and I suppose that's why, where I'm struggling. Does that make Sorry. sense? Sorry. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to give the best answer I can, and and we can clarify if I've missed the point. How's that? How's that, Paul? Yeah, sure, sure. So, um, I mean, the key thing really is getting the people who are doing that kind of uh, that coordination at that level involved in the design of it, um, because they should be able to really inform you as to what's what the important information is that they should be visualizing and you know which will help them make the decisions so to that as well um designing some grand kind of end-to-end -end solution from the get-go uh, might also prove a little bit problematic sometimes it's worth sort of growing it um with an aim of getting mm. getting the whole thing in one go rather than rather than trying to boil the ocean and get something perfect um first time around um and i think what you may find is when you do some, uh, you know, do a workshop where you do a board design with those people, you'll probably end up with several different designs and none of them will be perfect, but one of them will be, you know, maybe more acceptable to the group than, than most. Um, but once it's designed, you will then find that there's going to be more stuff that you need to change about it. It's, it, you know, it's going to evolve as time goes on. You're not going to get it right from the get go. I don't know if that answers your question. It, it does, yeah, because what, what I've done is I've sort of, um, I've incorporated the people who are coordinating the, um, it's, 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 it's actually a, it's like a release board or a, we're calling it a product board, but it's mostly about coordinating the scrum teams and, and, and coordinating the, the sort of like, you know, the, um, the, the dependencies between the teams and, uh, you know, the, how we're going to release, etc. cetera. Um, because there are a lot of dependencies. And so what I've done is I've, you know, taken certain elements of each, certain representatives for each scrum team, but also our uh, DevOps, a member from the DevOps team, et cetera, and, or a couple of systems people as well, and saying, well, look, how do we, how does, how does, how does the product actually get to, get in the customer's hands? What sort of stages do we have to go to? But not go into too much detail, but at a high level, what sort of stages does that item of value what statuses does it go through? And that's the way we've looked. And we, we've, we've agreed on a board, but I suppose my my concern is, oh, I'd like to get it right first time, but I think what you've confirmed is don't expect to, just just try and experiment with it and see where you get to, really. Yeah, and, and, and I think the, the other thing to say, um, which um, we, we usually recommend to people is, do some form of uh, modeling of what the dependencies are. And again, you're not gonna get this right from the get go, mm. but, um, you know, one way of doing that is, is, you know, getting, getting people, having conversations with people and asking who they commonly work with outside their team. And then you sort of mm. model, you can do almost like a, like a map of that. And mm. it will, it will see you who's on, show you quite quickly, um, 
who's under the most pressure you know who, who's getting the most asks from the most people and then you can uh you, you know you can work to help help with help them and and visualize what they're doing as well yeah that's that's what i've done actually so thanks for that that's brilliant thank you yeah and it's an interest, interesting aspect of there because in in uh, paul when i was when I was listening to you you, you seem to have a, like a, a, a Adding, adding a flight level too. I mean, um, uh, for those of you that might not be so familiar with the concept of flight levels, like flight level, what we call flight level one are the typical teams where the focus is about delivering, delivering work. Yeah. Um, a flight level two will be more about end to end flows. It will be more about resolving coordination issues, orchestration, dependencies, and so on. Yeah. And you go to that flight level three is strategic conversations. Paul, when you were talking about there, you, you, you were talking about that there is a clear issue, a clear um, challenge in coordinating teams. So yeah, there is, yeah. going what going what you both and JP were talking about is like the, the, the flight level two that you will be exploring there is like how what could we do in order to create something that helps that coordination issue, visualize the the challenge, visualize what's happening between those teams at a higher level. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So exactly. that so, so you you and and so you you also have like a, a, um the the metaphor of high level the, of high levels is that you're not at the ground you're you're you know ten a thousand feet up ten thousand feet up looking at a yeah. wider picture and say okay, how do can we coordinate this so that we address that coordination issues yeah, yeah. and and and, yeah. and get the teams to be more synchronized and so on. So yeah, 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 that, brilliant. yeah. That, that's where the fight level two works about could be a, a, a starting to look at these things like let's 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 resolve the issue. Let's have that bigger picture. Yeah. Jose, can I can I ask a follow up question on that? Mm -hmm. Yes. For JP, of course. Yes. Um, so I, this is not necessarily speaking about flight level two is because like flight level two, because I don't actually have the, the knowledge of exactly what that entails, but mm -hmm. um, you know, I've worked with in organizations where we've created some kind of um, higher level board to to visualize whether that was flight level two or not. So similar mm -hmm. to what Paul was asking is, you know, what I've experienced is, and I'm not saying I agree with this, often at that flight level two-ish level, oh. it's things like epics. Sorry, give me a sec. Um, it's things like epics that, that get visualized there. Mm -hmm. But what often happens is, um, you know, the, the purpose of an epic is not necessarily to complete it. You know, when you decompose an epic, you might find value in 50% of it. So essentially what ends up happening is you have this, this flight level two board with all these open epics, um, you know, with, with work that's, you know, that's still attached to them. That's, um, that's not going to be done for, you know, months or if ever. Um, JP, have you kind of experienced that and how have you kind of dealt with that? Uh, so I, I mean I, I have seen I have seen that happen. I, I mean I, the other the other risk that what ends up happening at that level is that um, you can end up with just a bunch of arbitrary work which is being put on a board for, for reporting line purposes rather than actually helping anything else. That's that's another kind of uh, thing that you see happening. Um, what I think the thing to bear in mind is if you're in that kind of scenario, Dylan, where uh, you've got maybe sort of like an, an open-ended intent to work on a specific area of, of, of work, um, then perhaps what you should be measuring is, is progress towards when good enough is within that. Uh, and what I mean by that is you might have uh, the epic actually kind of uh, you know, at some level within within that board, and then you might be modeling all the different stories that that kind of relate to that epic going across with some sort of measure on there of when when that's kind of good enough so that you can kind of say, look, actually, we no longer need to be dealing with that epic because we've got enough of that stuff done and we can focus on other priorities. So that's one way that, um, you know, I've seen seen that dealt with. Yeah, I, I, I would like to that. I would like to that as well is that whether we're using the what language you're using and how you're using all these things about epics or features or initiatives so that that's going to be very 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 contextual yeah um the one thing that i would add to that is that whatever is the definition of that unit of flow that you have a flight level two still has a flow yeah so you still need to 
kind of like it's it's not dissimilar to what you will do that you, when, when you are designing those boards when you're designing the the workflow the work item definitions all those things yeah it's not dissimilar to what you will do at team level it's just that the it's a it's it's a different order of magnitude potentially yeah but if something doesn't if you have something that is just there um, uh, as a how can I say an accumulator of potential future work that maybe is not what that's not something that that will flow through a workflow yeah so you you might need to do something that extracts sub elements of that which which then you flow through your flight level two um workflow yeah 100 yeah? percent so so yeah i mean if, if you have if you have a, a flow at that level a, a board at that level that is not where, where flow is not present those those feel like they're just like generators of ideas or something mm -hmm. like that and, and you know whatever language you use for those yeah, um, yeah, yeah. fly level two still has a flow in it you still have like you know work that needs to be done and work that flows to complete mm -hmm. it and, and then you have some element of validation um, um for customer value and all those things yeah okay Thanks very much. I wonder if I can add sort of an, an observation, I guess. Um, mm. So mm. Paul mentioned as, as he was mm. talking about what his flight level two board was, he meant he described it as a release board and he sort of glanced over it. But um, that that sort of stuck out to me as what we're really trying to track is the the changes that we're making to our set of applications um, that that we hope to have some outcome. Right. We hope to have some some value for the organization mm. um, and there there might be we might have uh, multiple epics across multiple teams that we're going to pick a set of stories from, and we're going to implement all of those stories at, at one time. And that's the unit of value that we're delivering. Um, and that, that thinking of it as a release board or as, as a set of, uh, I, I don't know, some, something that might be there. I'm not sure. Paul, any thoughts on that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think um, it's, I, th I think you're right, it's, it's, it's mm -hmm. more, it's, I think you're right, and it's, it's very contextual. Um, mm -hmm. I think what's, what's really important to me with regards to flight level two, and what, what I figured out is there's a couple of things, is number one, it's, it's, it's the coordination, but number two, uh, probably the most important thing from what I've experienced so far is the conversation. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the board is there, from my perspective, the board is there just to support that. Um, and once I think, I think, um, I think what was said earlier was like, you know, getting those people involved in designing the board is half the battle. And once you've done that, then you're, you're, you're going to get engaged conversations. And that's probably what I'm finding at the moment is the most valuable thing at flight level two is getting that, you know, I think we have a weekly flight level two meeting. We don't call it flight level two, but it's a weekly meeting, mm -hmm. uh, where there's a coordination or a sync, I call it or something and uh, a synchronization. And it's the conversation that I'm finding is very, very, very important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that, I don't know if that rings true with any of you guys. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it does. It does resonate with me a lot because I mean, a lot, a lot of many times of uh, lots of the systems that we build and all this stuff, they are not what they help is. Uh, you know, if I make a, a, a tiny connection to things like um, Scrum and so, and so on, is is this idea of groups of people self-coordinating, self-organizing, self-managing. Um, um, I love how Dan Vacanti talks about many times Kanban, saying like, you know, when you have a good a good Kanban system, good metrics in place, what, what helps people is to make better questions earlier on. And that's, you know, that's to me is many times a evidence of a system that is really helping a collect a group of human beings making making better decisions making better work yeah um yeah. so in some ways it resonated with what, oh, yeah that's cool. a good point thanks jose hmm. excellent okay um Dylan, you had a couple of like long messages there would you, yeah. do you want to um share ask yeah. <laughs> um hmm. okay so the first one actually don's familiar with this one as well um so what I've experienced in large organizations, they're keen to keep structure. And so they generally gravitate to anything that looks like an agile structure. So for example, mm -hmm. Spotify with the, the alliances and the, the squads and the tribes, etc. Anyways, the place I'm working at the moment's kind of adopted that. And um, that's where I find myself right now. So the question is, at the moment, they've kind of set up their alliances based on 
customer journey. So one alliance, uh, so by customer journey, if you imagine um, you buying something online, you know, the first part of the journey is like uh, you're learning about the product. Um, so that's, there's a whole bunch of squads to do with product information and things like that. Then the next part of the journey might be, you know, to actually buy something. So putting it in your basket and then there's a checkout part of the journey. And that's how they've sliced it up. But just, something just doesn't feel quite right because um, it's it doesn't necessarily feel like the squads are aligned in terms of a value stream. It's, you know, there still seems like there's dependencies across these alliances. Um, and so I'm curious, I'm, you know, I, I appreciate when, when you get to large organizations, the complexity kind of increases because you've got multiple squads dealing, you know, with the same area. But I was just curious, JP, if you've seen any other patterns um, of, of how you can kind of help organizations, if they still attach to come some kind of structure, you know, how, you, how they can group, um, you know, kind of squads together. Oh, sure. So it's, it, I mean, it, it's if I think if I had the perfect answer for this, I'd probably be sitting on an island somewhere. So <laughs> that's my my caveat. <laughs> I enough. probably wouldn't be here, but but um, I, I can give you some thoughts. So what I, I think you know what you see with the Spotify model, you see this with other things, other things as well. And um, it seems because somebody has written about it that maybe if we just take that learning somehow it's going to rub off on us and be okay so it to me it's a little bit like um you know you've got your favorite celebrities you start wearing you know you start wearing the same sunglasses as them because like somehow it's gonna you know that their their celebrity is gonna gonna rub off on you um i think the most important thing is what problem are they trying to solve and it may well be that they've already figured that out but it's kind of like you know here is the model we're going to implement. Now, what was the question? Um, it tends to be uh, quite an easy approach that people go to, and it then leads to these sort of pains that you're that you're observing. Um, and I would then, you know, given that that's that's already in progress, I would then be thinking, well, all right, how can we learn from this? And then, then how can we evolve this into something which works for this organisation? Um, because obviously, when you've already implemented things like squads and you've done it in a particular way, um, there may be very good reasons for that, which I'm not aware of. But I'd be looking to say, well, OK, you know, why, why did this happen? What can we learn from this? And then how can we evolve to where we need to be for our context and for who we are? Uh, when I've, you know, whenever I've spoken to um, Cliff Hazel um, from the Flight Levels Academy, he was a coach at Spotify he's always at pains to highlight the fact that people you know go to gravitate towards the spotify model without really thinking about actually it's all the learning that went into the generation of the spotify model that's important not the spotify model itself um you know it's 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 having that kind of um approach to learning within your organization that's the most important thing so um i don't have I, I don't I mean, I don't even think there is like a one fixed best way of doing this for any organization because every organization is different. Um, so for me, it's more about how can I generate a culture of, of learning and, you know, evolution for that company to the, be the best that it can possibly be. Being mindful as well with large organizations, they're usually pretty successful. So they've done something right somewhere along the line. And one of the risks you can do is kind of wander in and go, yeah, you've got it all wrong. And actually, they're doing quite a lot right. So, uh, you know, find the balance. 100%. Thanks, Jeffy. Yeah. It's, it's, to add something that you were saying there, like um, sometimes what we see in with organizations when we when we apply the answer before we know the question in that way, yeah, yeah. is that... Um, what we what we can see okay many times is that what we may have, perhaps we have gone from traditional team structures hierarchical structures to more agile structures but what we may but we haven't really done any 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 changes to what is underneath in the organization yeah or other things that happen in the organization so we end up almost replacing some side of the, some some dependencies and some problems with other type of problems yeah and um, we've seen sometimes like to have like you know product teams and then what you have end up with with product silos 
but in an organizational context where those products are not independent. So you just replace the, the type of dependencies that they had before with new ones. Um, so it's not always, you know, that, that what, what JP was saying, if, there was, if it was a really, really good answer, we, probably none of us will have jobs because it will be resolved or, or someone would be very, very rich. Yeah, um, it's, 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 it's about what's, the answers are going to be very, very contextual. And and many times we are obsessed with teams, with teaming, team, the team being the answer. Teams are great, but they are not always the right answer. Yeah. Some there are some situations where you just, you know, you you might have to apply other other models, like a more service based model or service based uh, service based models rather than teams and stuff like that. So, you know, most organizations are going to be very rich in what they need. And we just have to be be mindful of that. There is no specific answer, I guess. That's what I'm trying to say. Thanks. Okay. Any thoughts? Anybody has anything to add? I mean, deal on yourself and your experience. Someone else? Any any additions to it? No. All right. Um, I'm going to skip the next one that you have, Dylan. But uh, um, Matthew, would you like to ask your any any questions that you have? Any Matthew Jovi? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jose. I, I really struggle with my internet, so I just hope it stays free. Um, yeah. At the moment, I'm grappling with, um, it's a bizarre sort of situation. I'm, I mean, at the moment, never seen it before. I guess we all kind of face uh, unique moments every now and again. Mm -hmm. I'm working with a bunch of um, SaaS product um, re uh, relationship managers. Uh, there's about uh, four, five of them in the group. And a lot of the work they do is managing our dependencies that are outside the function, uh, hmm. completely outside the function, um, security, uh, uh, cloud, uh, just sort of uh, high level DevOps, and sometimes legal. Um, and typically uh, their work tends to sit outside, right? But it, it, the, the wait time when the work, when they engage the other teams takes about roughly 60 days and they've got absolutely no control uh, and so they can't sit on their hands so they, they've got to keep busy or keep working because got tons I'm not quite certain how to limit help them limit their sort of uh, working progress they've got, at the moment they've got well over 60 items in flight potential in flight to be done within the next two years this is a strategic team right i anyone anyone faced up those sort of uh issues uh, i mean it takes about sometimes 90 days just to get feedback back from the other team so, you, yeah i um i think there's there's a thing that there's a thing that we have which we um we, we kind of casually refer to it's jose's rules of flow and I wish I'd be sort of thinking, thinking in terms of a little bit of that, plus some of the other things we were referring to with the flight level two board earlier. So one of the, those rules is um, try not, well, basically try not to start work unless you know you can complete it. And that leads to an interesting conversation, which is, um, you know, if you've got to, if, if you know that a piece of work and you don't always know this, but if you do know before you start a piece of work, let's say you've got to get some kind of legal sign off is well well how can you how can you work with legal to make sure that that's dealt with in a timely fashion and that could be any other it could be security it could be be whoever um and generally speaking that ref, that that leads to you having to have conversations with those people before you even start the work um and having to visualize what that journey is going to then look like get some kind of agreements on on you know how they're going to handle work when you request it uh, and it may well be that you end up having to go at a, a higher level than just that team, because pretty much it sounds like all the pain that that team's got is completely outside of its its kind of immediate sphere of influence. Um, things that can help with that is doing things like blocker clustering. So you can, you know, when you when you've got these items which are just stuck, you can uh, surface exactly what's going on, find the find the thing that's most painful, and and try dealing with that to start with. Um, and, you know, like I said, if you've got an idea of, uh, again, I'll pick on legal, if you've got an idea of how swamped legal are, um, then 
how, how do you coordinate with them to make sure that you don't just end up making their life even more uncomfortable? So those would be things that I would be looking to try to deal with because I don't think you're going to be able to help the team you know, immediately at that level. You're going to have to go at a higher level to help them if it's external to the to stuff that they can work with directly. Right, I, I think so. Give my there's any... possible naivety here. Um, I might have missed something, but I, it's, I mean, with our Kanban board, <laughs> they are. Thank you, Michael. Um, we have a blocked column or we have a waiting a response from column. So that lead time doesn't affect our metrics per se. And it's clean and clear and transparent about where work is. If it's not actively being worked on, it's not in progress. So, yeah, but, yeah but, there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of, a bunch of things there. And, uh, you know, um, I don't, I, I don't necessarily know enough about your context. I just kind of take what I'm about to say with a pinch of salt. But um, I generally say that, you know, if you've got an if you've got a state in your workflow, then it, it should be something which is a value delivery step, ideally. So uh, when I see a blocked column, I generally ask if it's an aspirational state that you want your work item to go through, because it's a part of the value delivery for getting things to customers, which is a little bit tongue in cheek, I know, but um, it can be useful for helping you to visualize, but um, it's depending on the electronic system that you've got and so forth. I would still say that the, the once you started the work, even if it's stuck in a blocked state, ideally it should count towards however you're limiting with. And also it should be counting towards the time because it is part of the time of delivering that within that system, even if it is in a blocked state. So that, that, that would be the technical answer I would give, although bearing in mind that everybody's context is a little bit different, you might have different agreements and so forth with, with the people that you're working with. Can we split, split the story? Can it be, okay, we know we can do this bit and then it's gonna go waiting for X, Y, Z. So you have the pre-legal story and then you have the post-legal story. So the, the question I would have would be, once it's delivered, in, in its split state, would the customer still see something valuable from it? Uh, and if the answer Matthew, is... I'm stepping on your toes here, so Matthew, please jump in if I'm... I'm so, yeah, so the answer is no. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> so it's, yeah, so all the other components have to be in place. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that it, it's one of those things as a workaround, we... we we've kind of got into this, this habit of, of uh, breaking things down to sort of work around our problems almost. And sometimes that actually hides some of the problems that we've got. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, our, our, uh, um, our friend Luke, the way that he kind of describes this is, you know, the customer ends up asking for like a, a boulder and kind of we break it down into smaller and smaller stones until we basically got a handful of dust. And like kind of recompiling a handful of dust back into a boulder is a really, really difficult thing. And actually just delivering dust to a customer when they've asked for a boulder is not necessarily useful either. So, you know, it, it's um, sometimes we find ourselves working around the problem rather than dealing with the problem head on as a result of, of coming up with things, these things. But thanks for your suggestion. Yeah. If, if I may add something that is, to me that is also very interesting, I'm, I'm it's going a little bit back to what, what JP and actually resolving this problem, addressing, not going around these problems and tackling them one way or another. Yeah. Is what, what he was saying before. Many times we start the work simply because we have capacity to start it, but we, we are not paying attention about whether, what might be the potential dependencies that we have. So we may start the work completely oblivious about where it could get stuck somewhere, especially if, especially if we have dependencies with, with other people. But even worse sometimes is that even if we know that it's going to likely to get stuck in legal, we still start the work. And we still know that it's going to get stuck in legal. Yeah. Um, now, if you, if, you, if you picture that the, this connection that there is between the, our team and the legal team, yeah, um, by, by there is there is there a relationship which potentially is not well managed or is not managed so so that relationship could create these long-term delays blockers um people overworking each other creating interruptions creating pressure on each other so all that can turn into um a vicious loop yeah um 
there is there is some there is a dependency there which is not well managed and it can become negative now our challenge is to say okay how can we turn this from something that is vicious into something that is virtuous can we turn this into a collaborative opportunity maybe it's like let's not start the work because we know that legal let's not start this piece of work because it needs legal and legal is already busy so let's have a conversation with legal yeah um it might be things about what can we do to to facilitate this relationship so perhaps your their their cycle time the response time gets faster yeah things like that it's like like why why do we have dependent these dependencies and what can we do to facilitate those dependencies becoming more of a collaboration as well yeah um if we don't do that yes what we end up doing and many organizations what we have is this um we we think that what we are doing is delivering value and most of the time what we're doing is just creating interruptions on one another and then we're trying to manage the interruptions and manage the dependencies rather than delivering value so 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 many organizations you you look at the the, the way they, they they actually work is not value delivery it's like basically let me piss you off delivery kind of thing because we don't handle them we're just creating friction many times yeah um so so i will i will i will try to encourage people to say okay when you have those 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 many dependencies try to turn them into a positive relationship little by little yeah um and going into the blockers as well is like you know the end customer is still waiting once we started to do the work the clock started they, they, we created an expectation so the in some ways the customer doesn't care of whether that was stuck in a delivery or was being delivered or there was more work or was blocked they almost don't care and they don't, they don't see it they only know that it's taken two years to get delivery and that's not good enough yeah so that's why for me many times like things that are blocked they, they, the clock is ticking and if it happens regularly that these things get blocked we need to do something about them sooner or later i mean that, that that's my view on this Dave is smiling. <laughs> Thanks, Elsie. Thanks, JP. Yeah. Any thoughts on that, anyone? Uh, uh, Other things? Any contributions? I think... Um, Brianna, 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 Brianna wants to add something. Start, start with that and we'll come back to Brianna. I think okay. maybe you said it earlier on, um, Jose, like stepping up a level in the organization, like is legal, if it's legal, is legal currently working on something that's more valuable than we want them to work on and, and working that out sooner maybe maybe one of us shouldn't have started um, mm -hmm. um yeah and, and that's what for example when you have like common a common a department that becomes a service um like maybe legal you know that that's where things like flight levels might become a useful concept or, or something that looks at the well the picture is like, why, why are they so busy even actually um, don't say what you just said like even matthew's team that says that most of the work is about depending on other people maybe that team itself is some sort of like um a service in itself because it has all this all these external connections i, I don't know so, good point Bri brianna uh, so i'm going through a similar a situation that Matthew is going through and it's been a three and a half year problem and I am 100% dependent on another team and I've been trying desperately to break that dependency for three and a half years and mm. I, all every time I try to break it it's I'm now on my third CEO and fourth CTO <laughs> of a fortune 50 company so it's like I get handed a new executive instead to solve the problem and it's like that's not the problem I need and solved yes. and, and, yes. and the problem is I now report to the person who's creating the problem and my solution is every time I hit this DNS issue, the same DNS issue, I have figured out how much labor is it costs and the cost of delay. And so I have a running tally now. And so that running tally, and it's like, you know, it's a it's a $1 million problem. When it gets to $10 million, $10 million problem, uh, like that is gonna be forced to be reckoned with. And I will be the force behind it that, you know, makes it like you will address this. You can no longer ignore that this That's is good. not an issue. Hmm. Now, it, it took me a year and a half to figure out that there are ways of making this an issue to, to find it. And yeah. like, I recognize my problem may not be the biggest problem, but you know, if, if you've allowed it to go on for three and a half years, I'm going to show you it is an issue, right? Mm -hmm. And, 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 and if you can, if you can afford to ignore this, 
then please clarify what is bigger priorities. And I'll go help you fix those problems, but, but please quit ignoring me and quit ignoring that this is an actual valid issue. Um, mm. and, and sometimes it falls on to, it may not be your day job to figure out how to solve this, you know, how to track it, but sometimes putting some kind of metric and, and, and a painful one at that behind it yeah. helps solve the problem. Um, yeah. All I can say is wish me luck because because I'm getting towards that $10 million threshold that I'm going to be like, okay, do we solve this problem or not? Do you care? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's great. As uh, as Matthew says, boom. <laughs> um, one, actually, as you were saying that, another another thing that can that can also help go, going going back to the aging um, charts as well is that all these dependencies, all these things that are happening are costing money they they will also be showing up in a in an aging chart as like they're getting you know from 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 red to even to black you know it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse and 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 it might create the incentives to say why are we why are we burning time and effort and things in here why is this here but you know we started it it's not finished what can we do about it so you combine that with the with the cost that it has and the impact it has as well yeah very very powerful yeah. conversations and it's very, very hard when, yeah, of course, it belongs to another silo because, you know, the executive I'm trying to deal with, or the director I'm trying to deal with this as well, is he sees it as a 30, 30 to $60,000 labor, labor saving. I see it as a $1.2 million production issue on my mm -hmm. side, which means it's a $2 million production issue on his side. And I'm like, please stop handing me the wrong individual who doesn't have the qualifications to mm -hmm. handle this issue. You, you do need an engineer to solve this problem, not an analyst. Like you actually need someone who has engineering understanding understanding mm -hmm. to actually solve this it doesn't have to be an engineer but it has to have engineering understanding and it has this level of competency right because this is the issue you are now facing because you don't have to pay for it doesn't mean it's not your problem right mm -hmm. this, this collectively impacts us and and being able to understand how these independencies work can really set you up for success right yeah. like yeah. Now, it can also get you ignored really quickly if, if you're if you're we get too loud sometimes, but at the same time, being able to, to highlight the and financial, just financial cost is an easy way of doing it. There are other ways of doing this. It, it's just, it, and it took, like I said, it took me a year and a half to figure out all these costs, but being able to show this $1.1 million, this 30, 30 to $60,000 labor costs caused a four, you know, $1.2 million production issue on, on my end as the infrastructure maintainer and a, you know, a two, I think it was a $2.4 million production application issue for you please don't tell me that's the problem you're trying to solve it's not you know because that was that was you know that was absorbed by our customer and they are angry at us for it so it can take a long time but you have and you have to be patient with working that out and showing visuals to it now if you're getting ignored with all that then the battle's lost move on to something else but at the same time being able to show some because because if someone's not experiencing that pain they're not necessarily the ones going to solve the problem also sometimes when you show somebody something that painful it's too painful for them to take on board so they just shut down and ignore it it's the kind of you know bury your head in the sand type approach so that does also happen as well um you know there are there are times we've worked with organizations where we've shown them something alarming shall we say and they've just rejected it out of hand because they just weren't ready for it. And that's okay. I mean, you, you, if you carry on pressing, then you're just gonna get an even worse response. There will come a time where people are ready for it. It's just not now. So you've done your best time to just kind of step back, let it accrue a bit more. And then maybe in a month or two's time or six months, they're, they're ready to take it on board and do something about it. We'll do another reorganization and this time we'll do a Spotify. You know, every time we talk about things like that, and I hear Brianna talking about, I, I, I'm i going to do a quick image share because I, I, this meme keeps hitting me. The one that says, like, sure, sure, I'm glad I, this is not on our end. Okay. Well, we're in the same boat. Uh, that's so brilliant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'll put the link on the chat if you if you want to, to pick it up. Yeah. <laughs> yes, please. But that's that's how many times we're behaving. And what JP say, what JP was saying, like we we kind of like we we are really as human beings. It's, if it's a scary, we are really good at ignoring it. So how can you make it, in some ways, something that people have to pay attention to in some ways, yeah, as safely as possible? That's great. Okay, um, we are um, running almost towards the end. This is the time is flying. Um, the, 
I, I remember there was a second question by Dylan. Dylan, do you want to go back to that second question that you had? And that would be the last question. Um, is there nobody else I say that's got any questions? I don't I haven't seen any other questions since then, so it's yours. You okay. you have a you have a room. All right. Um thank you. So mm. uh, the questions around I suppose language, JP, and um this, this the language here specifically being lead time and a number of teams have kind of created their own definition um for example some teams only measure the lead time from almost when there's a commitment i.e they refined the item of work um you know where, whereas others maybe a bit more traditional in once it's been added to the backlog um have you seen this kind of thing happen this pattern happen in organizations and how have you dealt with it let's fight <laughs> <laughs> So, um, I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of controversy over the language, and what our, um, our our suggestion usually is is, you know, come up with a definition and stick to it rather than having multiple definitions. Um, I think, I you know, certainly if it's something you're trying to measure, and you're trying to use that for some form of forecasting. I would lean towards measuring it from the when the work is actually commenced rather than when it ends up in some sort of queue before it starts commenced. I, I, I'm not sure whether I heard you right, Dylan, but it sounded to me like you were saying some teams were basically measuring the time after they'd actually started doing some form of work on it, whereas others, it was just when it kind of ended in their inbox. Is that, is that kind of in summary correct? Yeah, so, um, so, so some teams would only, the clock would only start for the lead time when they had committed to it so it's been refined others the the clock would start um from the date it was added to the backlog yeah. um so yeah. i mean again context con context is all with this but typically speaking when something ends up in a backlog there's still a sense of optionality about it um and so you know when you're going to execute that option who knows um that might not be the case with these teams um but I, I would lean more, I'd lean more to coming up with a definition, which is, you know, it's, it's when the work is actually progressing. Um, and, you know, whether you call it lead time, whether you call it cycle time, whether you call it, you know, uh, spinning plate time, that's kind of just providing you agree on what you're measuring and, and, and how you're measuring it, then, then, you know, I suppose that's kind of all that's the, the most important thing. Um, I mean, you know, the, the other thing that I would say is if, because I'm, I'm hearing that you're trying to get some sort of standardization for this. What are you hoping to achieve with that? I mean, I, I suppose, you know, from, from an improvement perspective, you know, if we're looking at making some improvements, you know, when we're using language across various squads, we, we kind of know what we're measuring. Yeah. And it's not to compare, it's just that we know what we're measuring. Um, and I mean, JP, we measure cycle time and lead time um, and, and so, like, I know there's a lot of debate about this. That's probably why Jose said <laughs> there's a fight coming on. Um, but I've always seen lead time is, as the time from when the request is made to when it's delivered. And cycle time is when you commit to start working on it. Um, but, but, you know, that's, I, I don't want to impose my definition on the organization. I, I suppose what I'm trying to do is get a consensus. And maybe you ask that question to me, does it matter? Um, you know, does it matter that there's an agreed definition? Um, or is it is the value more about measuring and improving? So, I, and I think I mean I think it does I think it does matter. There's an agreed definition. Whether that definition is textbook, I think, is where it really comes into into yeah. question. It's just 100%. having a shared understanding of what you're meaning when you're having a conversation. Yeah. Um, you know, if some teams are using lead time and then cycle time, and other te teams have lead time which is the same as cycle time, then that's going to lead to confusion. So I would be um, advocating for at least coming up with a standard definition of what everybody means when they say something, whatever that is. So um, you're probably on the right track to say, look, you know, we want to look at things from an improvement perspective. We want to be speaking the same language. So can we at least agree that, you know, when it enters this kind of state, we're talking in terms of it being this. And when it's entered that kind of state, we're talking in terms of it being that. And, um, you know, if that's lead time and cycle time, if this is lead time and that is cycle time, then so be it. Yeah. Um, to, to, to support what JB was saying there, that, that's the important thing is like the, the name, actually the name is the least important. It's 
having a common understanding of what that name is being referred to across the team. Otherwise, we end up another source of conflict and misunderstanding because it's like the, the word quality. Yeah, everybody talks about quality, but do we have a common understanding of what quality means? You know, because to me, maybe it works in my machine. For JP, it's like he has done all this other other crazy stuff. Yeah, um, with lead time, with cycle time, with with when does the clock start, where does the you know, or not? Sometimes the conflict is that we don't have the same common understanding. Um, do you remember a few years ago which was the which was the Mars space probe that that um, crashed on the surface of Mars? Um, I don't remember which one of them was. And the, the problem was eventually that the two teams, there was like a European team, I think it was, and an American team. And they had to do a piece which was like three centimeters and some of us three, and some of them were using inches. The other ones thought it was centimeters. And because they were using different units, misunderstanding happened, the whole thing crashed on the surface of mass. Um, as an example, this is what happens many times. We talk about lead time, we talk about cycle time, but we don't have a common definition. So. Um, that's that's the that's I, the important thing. You know, make sure that people have a common I prefer, definition. I prefer to think in terms of Spinal Tap with their Stonehenge, frankly, which is you know eighteen inches versus eighteen feet. <laughs> Don't get it. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> Google it. Uh, we have to Google that. Okay, so we've got to the end of time. Not all time, but this time. So I would like to say thank you to all of you. We're gonna keep we're gonna keep to the clock, you know, we're gonna keep to the time box. Amazing. Um thank you very much for, for all of you for being here. Um thank you for all the questions and especially thank you very much to JP for, for giving us one hour of his time. Um great conversations. We'll try to get a recording in the YouTube channel um of um especially the playlist for Lineage London. Um should be hopefully tonight. Um so yeah, thanks a lot. And we will see you at the next event. If you are in the Lineage London group, Meta group, there is an, an event in the next um, couple of weeks. Um some really interesting um talk we think um if you are in pro kanban group there is a i think the next asked a kanban trainer session is going to be in may early may um so yeah check check those two groups and and hopefully we'll see you again that's it thanks, thanks very much, much. Thanks, thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.